Good afternoon um, and uh, yes, welcome uh, to what promises to be a, a really interesting uh, session. We're very grateful to Colin and to Celia for uh, performing, if that's the right word, this afternoon. Of course, this project was much wider than, than, than just Colin. Uh, because originally it, became, it came out of the, uh, the work of the art table at Walking Wednesday and very much Russell uh, Robson and Joe Holland were involved and uh, certainly in the early days, uh, sadly they're not able to be with us of course today to share in what's going on, uh, but Colin continued, but only Colin can and uh, uh, so we're very grateful uh, to him for that and we look forward. Uh, he does me to say a few words about, uh, about King Alfred, the great <coughs> linchpin of English uh, Christianity, and I'll tell you everything that I know, which won't take many seconds. Uh, he was born in the year 849, and he was the King of, West, of the West Saxons, who effectively brought to an end the constant threat of Danish domination in the British Isles. He came to the throne at the age of 22, and after establishing peace, he set about bringing stability to both church and state. He gave half of his income to founding religious houses, which themselves acted as Christian centres for education, care of the sick and the poor, and respite for travellers. He was a daily attendant at Mass, and himself translated many works into the vernacular. He evolved a legal code based on common sense and Christian mercy, his whole life was marked by the compassion of Christ and he died on this day in the year 899. I'm looking forward to seeing how Colin is going to reenact the 22 year old <laughs> King Alfred. And, uh, and so he's now going to tell us about his life. Let's imagine as we call Alfred back to explain himself. Come forth Alfred, come explain yourself. Quiet! That means listen. You may be wondering why I am wearing this cloak and why I came with a crook and why I pick up this sword. The thing was, I was never expecting to be a king. I, well, there were five brothers, of which I was the youngest, and our father, Ethelwolf, was king, and we weren't expecting to get down to me. But you will hear later on how it came about. Anyway, I wondered, I thought perhaps that your Anglo-Saxon wouldn't be very good because not many people speak it nowadays. But just listen to this. Oh, incidentally, in my little book, I, from a very early age, kept a little book from when I could first scribble. People used to write things for me in it that they thought I ought to know. And I was very good at learning. I could learn poems and and stories from the early, my earliest years. 
but I always had a little book with me to write things down or to get someone else to write them down if they seemed important. And here it is. Now here, they see if you recognize this. Fede ora voda erst on hivonum. Si the nama gihad go. Givotha thine willa. On eothan swa swa on hivonum. which being interpreted is our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that is how the language of my time was spoken. But it was a problem for me to be a king because I didn't like the cruel side that had to be if you were going to be a ruler in those days. Because Jesus said that, well he didn't say, but he believed that you should love your enemies and not kill them. But we had to kill our enemies if we wanted to maintain our rule. And so it was often very cruel. childhood. I'm getting old now, my memory is failing, but as a child I couldn't have been better looked after. I was greatly loved by my father and my mother, and they, though they were obviously terribly busy with affairs of state, but they preferred me in many ways to my elder brothers, who were rather a rough lot. And my mother was a scholar, and they didn't actually want to learn things except how to fight, at which they were pretty efficient, actually. But it never attracted me very much, though I did a bit of training, and I learned to look after myself on horseback with sword and buckler. And from the earliest days that I can remember, my dear mother used to tell me stories and read poems about the heroes of the olden days. And I used to badger her into telling them me, telling me them over and over again. In the long winter evenings, because winter evenings in those days were long and dark. I soon managed to gather in my mind some heroes people I wanted to be like, models, even at that early age. And they were rather a mixed bunch. There was King David, who I admired, and who was a very good, um, well, a soldier, actually, apart from other things. There was King Solomon, who was very wise, King, who, it is said, had his knights, his own thanes, who are still sleeping under the tor at Glastonbury, waiting for England to be in peril, they say. There was St. Augustine, um, St. Augustine of Hippo, not so much St. Augustine, who, kept, who brought her, uh, who came to convert us later on. St. Brendan, St. Brendan, who, it is said, sailed across the Atlantic in a coracle, in a leather-covered coracle, and who braved what must have been the terrifying waters of the North Atlantic, and of course the ice on the other side of the North Atlantic. Um, and then there were other people like the Venerable Bede who had written the history of the English people and the English church and English Christianity. And there was um, Charlemagne. Now Charlemagne the Great, 
Charles the Great, was definitely a hero of mine. In fact, as I grew older, I hoped I could turn the Kingdom of Wessex into something like what he was trying to turn, or what in fact did emerge as the Holy Roman Empire. Anyway, my life seemed to lie on a great arc of power somehow from behind me, before my, before my birth, in fact from creation itself to doomsday, and to stretch before me like a winding path through forests and seas which would be beset with hazards, of which I would have the courage and the knowledge and the faith to overcome. These heroes of mine had used all their minds to understand the world they found so that they would always know how to deal with all these different hazards. And it seemed to me that it would be something marvelous to risk your life for something truly worthwhile, some great idea. After all, even if I died in the attempt, I knew that God loved me and everything would be all right in the end. I knew also that I and the rest of mankind had to contend with our own impulses towards sin and to seek absolution. As my parents' pet, and I was really a bit of a pet of my brothers, my big brothers as well. They didn't think I was ever going to come to much, but you know, they liked me. Um, I could afford to indulge in such dreams. Uh, after all, I would never be a king, no way. And have to worry about things like combining Christian love with cruel and violent action. My brothers were always being drilled as warriors and I used to watch them at it, charging about on their horses, waving their swords and being sworn at by the house, by the horse pain. I joined in sometimes and became quite competent at hand-to-hand -hand fighting and I enjoyed going out hunting. But unlike me, my brothers were never taught to read and write and nor did they want to bother about such things which they considered other people could do better, you know, so why bother? But I was endlessly curious about everything. As soon as I could open a book, I worried it like a dog in an effort to wring out its meaning. And as soon as I'd worked out English, I started on Latin. Whatever Bishop Asser said about me later, I'll tell you about Bishop Asser in due course. I said enough for the moment. My wife will read The Dream of the Rood, a poem that was sent to me when I was crowned, together with a fragment of the true cross itself as a coronation gift from the Pope, Pope Marianus. <coughs> I was reared up a rude I raised the great king, liege lord of the heavens, dared not lean from the truth. They drove me through with dark nails. On me are the deep wounds manifest, wide mouth, hate dense. I durst not harm any of them. How they mocked us both. I was all moist with blood sprung from the man's side after he sent forth his soul. They lifted him down from the leaden pain, left me, the commanders, standing in a sweat of blood. I was all wounded with shafts. They straightened out his strained limbs stood at his body's head, looked down on the Lord of Heaven. For a while he lay there resting, set to contrive him a tomb in the sight of the tree of death, 
carved it of bright stone, laid in it the bringer of victory, spent from the great struggle. They began to speak the grief song, and in the sinking light, then thought to set out homeward. Their hearts were sick to death, their most high prince they left to rest there with scant retinue. <clears throat> Yet we three, weeping, a good while stood in that place after the song had gone up from the captain's throats. Cold grew the course. Fair fair soul house. They felled us all. We crashed to the ground, a cruel weird, and they delved for us a deep pit. The Lord's men learned of it. His friends found me. It was they who girt me with gold and silver. An extraordinary poem. See how this beautiful cross seems to be joining in the whole process of Jesus' crucifixion. And we have a rood above us here after the ascension, after his ascension to heaven. Now I'll tell you a bit more about my childhood. The royal household in which I lived was always on the move, calling Wittans all over the place to sort out problems, to distribute rewards and to gather taxes. I often went with them and watched, out, watched how my father would gain the loyalty of the elderman, the Shah Reeves and the Thanes. It seemed to require a mixture of loud laughs and hard stares and the giving of great gifts, often of land tenure, but sometimes rings or other objects of value. I think that my father loved me more than my brothers, but he was always busy and I didn't see a great deal of him as a rule. And when I was only four, only four years old, he packed me off to Rome under the care of Bishop Swithin of Winchester and an armed escort to meet the Pope. That was quite a business getting to Rome, um, right across, uh, across uh, Frankish territory, right the way down Italy to Rome. But then we went there. And I met Pope Leo IV. Now Rome was huge. It was magnificent. Uh, and Pope Leo himself was a lovely old man. <coughs> he made a great fuss of me and told me that he was my spiritual father. He had me anointed with holy oil and told me something a bit odd. He told me I would be a king one day. It was a kind thought, but I didn't really believe it at the time. Now, three years later, when I was seven, my father took me to Rome again to meet the Pope and to give him a gift of money from the people of Wessex. And on the way home, we spent time at the court of Charlemagne's grandson, the Frankish king, Charles the Bald, in his palace at Verberry. My dear mother had recently died, and to my surprise, my father asked Charles for the hand of his 13-year-old daughter, Judith, and they were married and we brought her back to Wessex. This apparently strengthened both our families as we were both threatened by the Vikings. <coughs> but when we returned to Wessex after a lengthy stay at this palace, there was a serious problem because my uncle Athelbald tried to prevent us landing as he wanted the whole of Wessex for himself, my uncle. My father 
managed to put a stop to that plan and avoid the, what would have been an inevitable civil war by offering to share the kingdom. Uncle Athelbald could command West Wessex and Father would command the Eastern End, which included Kent and Sussex. Things settled down for a while, except that marauding <coughs> bands of Vikings were arriving by the boatload all over the place, looting, killing, and generally causing havoc, and then disappearing again. And the Danes already owned about half the country from Northumbria downwards, but they wanted Mercia and Wessex as well. The fighting dribbled on as I grew up, as I grew up. and when I was 19, my father died. And my brother, King Ethelred and I were called north by Burgred, King of Mercia, who had previously been our enemy, but to help, off, to help fight off an invading Viking army. The Vikings took Nottingham and we surrounded them. But we were both running out of food and had to come to terms. This was when I met Alfred. Let me introduce myself. I am Aylesworth, daughter of Alderman Musin of Mercia. Since I was a Mercian noblewoman, it was considered to be a sound political move for Alfred to marry me. And I was not reluctant. <laughs> <laughs> we were married in 868 at Sutton Courtney with great feasting. But there was one sad note to the festivities. Alfred fell ill for the first time of the sickness which was to plague him all his life. But it was not too debilitating, for I was to bear him several children. The fighting didn't stop though, and I found myself embroiled in a series of battles against these marauding Viking bands. I acquitted myself surprisingly well, even commanding a force that defeated them at Ashdown. It didn't stop them coming though, and when I was 22, I was defeated myself at Wilton near Salisbury in my turn, though I managed to escape unhurt. And but by this time, my elder brothers had died one after another until I was the only one left. And in the year of our Lord, 871, I was anointed king in my turn. And I was in a position to start planning the safety of my realm. Time for another poem. This time, I will declaim it. I've always loved the ancient story of Beowulf the Goth. Wait, this is the story of Beowulf, the mighty hero of Gotland. Hrothgar, the king of the Danes, had a great mead hall in a place called Hierot, where mighty feasts are held, great mounds of food consumed, and gallons of mead poured down parched throats. After eating, there is raucous singing and hectic dancing, drumming, music, and ecstasy. For this is a foretaste of Valhalla, where dwell those warriors who die in battle. One day, a great monster, Grindel by name, invades King Hrothgar's hall and wrecks the feast, thrashing about and killing all he could reach. Beowulf is called for, and the next time Grendel comes, Beowulf leaps upon him and slays him with his sharp crown sword. Grendel's mother, in her fury, seeks revenge, but Beowulf slays her too. Fifty years pass, a great dragon emerges, and though he is growing old by now, Beowulf manages to kill it, but dies of the wounds he receives. His fellow warriors send him to Valhalla on a pyre of flame and build a tower to his name. Thus ends the story of Beowulf.
things were Things were relatively quiet for the next six years. Elswith was happy and started giving birth to our increasing family. As king, I now had the position, prestige and power to develop my ideas for a complete revival of my kingdom. My thoughts went something like this. <coughs> the kingdom of Wessex was in mortal danger and could be lost to the Vikings, who already had control of Northumbria and much of Mercia. And it seemed to me that this was more than just a battle for supremacy. It was more that we were being, we were being punished by God through the agency of the Viking marauders for our own sinfulness, slackness and ignorance. The Vikings were not just our mortal images, our mortal enemies. They were God's agents. We had to do more than just try and beat them in battle. It followed that there were three main tasks to be set in motion at the same time. First, to strengthen the defences of the realm with a chain of fortified and probably, properly manned bergs. To so have to become a centre of trade and craftsmanship supported by centralised and improved agriculture. At any one time, half the men of the burg would be at home working the land and the other half on duty in my army. Most of the burgs would be based on existing small towns. We would also need to start building a fleet of ships to defend our river mouths and other places where the Vikings were wont to land. Secondly, we needed to lift the clergy and nobles from their appalling ignorance by setting up schools to teach Latin and by providing appropriate reading matter in the common tongue. Thirdly, I had to prepare a dombon, a book of laws, to which everyone could subscribe. It would be based on the code of the Roman Emperor Justinian and the laws of offer and Ein, as well as local customary law. I was going to need to recruit experts in many fields to help me with these plans. So I set about finding them. <coughs> Especially as I was going to select the best authorities to translate selected books into the common tongue. And if possible, translate some myself. The most important of my band of scholars were Bishop Asser from Wales. John Scotus Erigena from Ireland, and the French scholars, Grimbald and Bishop <coughs> Werfer. And the books I selected were Pope Gregory's Pastoral Care, Boethius's Consolations of Philosophy, and the first 50 of the Psalms of David, and St. Augustine's Soliloquies. I sent a copy of Pope Gregory's pastoral care to each of my bishops, along with a jeweled istro, like this one. <coughs> a pointer for when you're demonstrating um, readings or poems or works of scholarship. Now each one of these, which were made by my own goldsmiths, were worth 50, well they were worth the equivalent of 50 oxen. <coughs> so the value of this was 50 oxen, which was actually more than the value of the life of one, of one peasant at that time. I also sponsored the launching of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle to carry on the work of the Venerable Bede in recording the history of the English. I will now read something different, Keedman's Hymn, 
Now, Keedman was a humble monk of Whitby who was encouraged by Abbess Hilda to develop his, his talents. No way school on her again, hen from the victor's world. Now we must praise the protector of the heavenly kingdom, the might of the measurer, and his mind's purpose, the work of the father of glory, as he for each of the wonders, the eternal Lord, established a beginning. He shaped first for the sons of the earth, heaven as a roof, the holy maker, then the middle world. Mankind's guardian, the eternal Lord, made afterwards. Solid ground for men, the almighty Lord. But all this activity which I was trying to unfold was grievously interrupted when the Danish king Guthrum arrived with a huge army in the year of our Lord 878 and captured Wehran, one of my strongest birds. During the freezing winter time, we had to choose a freezing winter at Christmas when we were all trying to have our Christmas celebrations. We watched him for a while, but eventually came to terms, but Despite those terms, he broke out and took Exeter, and later forced us out of our palace at Chippenham. However, I had seen this coming, and retreated hastily with some of my army and the royal household, including Aylesworth and the children, to a small fortress, palace, and workshops that I had prepared amongst the marshes at Athelney and spent the next four months until Easter traveling between the Thanes and Reeves, the West Wessex, Somerset and Hampshire, hiding in the woods, gathering information about Guthrum's movements and harassing him where possible. We needed the workshops to make and store weapons for the struggle to come. And it was here that St. Cuthbert was said to have appeared to him in a dream and told him that our descendants would one day be kings of England and lords of Britain. Uh, and there was another story which was later said to have happened in this place, but of which I heard nothing at the time. Something to do with cakes. It sounded most unlikely to me. <laughs> oh, um. Well, when Guthrum finally broke out of Chippenham to seek supplies for his army, my army was waiting for him at Eddington, where, to his surprise, we beat him soundly in battle with great slaughter. Guthrum and the remnant of his army retreated back into Chippenham, but after a couple of weeks they emerged and sought peace. To their astonishment, I fed him and his embassy and plied them with presents. I adopted him as my royal son and subsequently sponsored his baptism at Winchester, giving him the Christian name of Athelstan. I asked him to take the remnants of his army back to East Anglia, and later on at the Treaty of Wedmore, we established the borders of the Dane law, Danish control, law. Um, which is, if you take a line from London to Chester, was more or less the northeast of that line. He handed over Danish control of the remains of Wessex, remains of Mercia in Wessex, and he gathered to stry and stop marauding the Kentish end of Wessex. Now he was a Christian, and therefore he kept his word. Pagan Vikings had no concept of sticking to oaths. <laughs> After all, I could have had him killed. And not only that he was still alive, he was actually still a king, though now a member of my family rather than my enemy. There were 
plenty more problems between then and my death in the year of our Lord 899 and many more after my death. But my plans came into being surprisingly fast. What is more, a notion of Christian governance had taken root in the kingdom and the English language began its spread and the stage was set to incorporate England under one rule. Our descendants were the prophecy, prophecy made by St Cuthbert to my husband. At the end of his life, Alfred consecrated Athelstan, our grandson and a great favourite with his grandfather, as the Pope had consecrated him when he was only five years old. Athelstan was the son of Edward, our eldest son, who became King of Wessex after Alfred's death. But there was someone else who played an important part in consolidating the kingdom, which eventually became England. This was our eldest child, Ethelfled. Although, as a mere girl, she was not expected to inherit the crown, we did not confine her to domestic duties. She was educated with our sons and took a great interest in the affairs of the kingdom. When still a child, she met her future husband, Ethelred of Mercia, and impressed him greatly with her understanding of affairs of state. After their marriage, she took a full part in the management of the realm of Mercia. When Ethelred died, our daughter became sole ruler of the country and was known as the Lady of the Mercians. She proved to be an inspired leader, a match for any man. She built or rebuilt towers such as Chest towns such as Chester, Gloucester and Oxford, both as fortresses and trading centres. She was a brilliant negotiator but not afraid to lead her men into battle when she deemed it necessary. She commanded the respect and affection of all her thanes, and in alliance with her brother Edward, King of Wessex, kept the Vikings at bay and laid the foundations for the Kingdom of England. In addition to all her affairs of state, she fostered her nephew, Edward's son, Athelstan, and taught him, by example, how to be a worthy ruler. And Athelstan, in his turn, ru ruled both Wessex and Mercia and consolidated further conquest to become the first king of all England. And thus, the prophecy was fulfilled. <laughs>
as part of our service yesterday morning. Collins asked me to end with a prayer. I'm going to do so. Uh, there are st there's still some coffee. I think little, uh, some small amounts of coffee in that left. Please do stop and, and have some more. If you wish to uh, make a donation, then there's a basket at the back uh, in, in its usual place as you, as you leave. But uh, we'll close with a prayer of the colic for St. Alfred the Great. God, our Maker and Redeemer, we pray you of your great mercy and by the power of your holy cross to guide us by your will and to shield us from our foes, that after the example of your servant Alfred, we may inwardly love you above all things. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns now with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 And thank you for coming. King Alfred, come on, please, you're not even proud. <laughs>